sell more faster. The premium solution sales process for getting the premium price by Kim Orleski, read by Kim Orleski. This book is published by Results Press, copyright year 2019. Chapter one, it's all about relationships. There is no secret to sales. If you're hoping after reading this, you're immediately going to know the secret sauce for selling premium services at premium prices. I'm sorry to disappoint you. There is no magic formula. When we create higher value offerings for our clients, the sales process is longer, the relationships become much more entrenched, and the results become more fulfilling for both parties. Premium sales is all relationship. Selling premium services is about how we connect on a more holistic scale with individuals and ultimately how we create more of everything. Offering the very best services at luxury prices becomes less about what you say and do with your prospect and more about how we as human beings interact in a natural conversation and an ongoing relationship. We ask more questions. We become genuinely interested in helping the other person. We believe amazing things can be accomplished when we work together. Premium service providers look at every client interaction as a lifetime value. These are clients, partners, and family members for life. And if the relationship matters, as it should, we take extra care in ensuring the relationship is always cared for. We're all people. We like being treated one way and dislike being treated another. The closest thing to the secret of sales Be a good person, be honest, deal with integrity, enjoy every moment. Sales is fun. It truly is. When you believe you will truly help people are ready to share your impact with the world and love engaging and learning about other people, that's all sales is. Chapter two, sell more faster. In my first sales career at the end of the year was always the big push. It was the last attempt to make our sales targets and to achieve bonus status. If we were already at our revenue target for the year, commission rates were boosted. Every sale was worth more money. This is where the big dreams started to feel less like pipe dreams and more like reality. Some reps would be making more money in this one pay period than most people would make in one year. I was determined to be one of those reps. The full month of December would be a buzz. I would hear chatter in the bullpen from several reps as they bragged about spending their bonuses and extra commissions on buying new vehicles, down payments for a condo, or going on a luxurious vacation. For a select few of us who would make over 150% of our targeted plan, this also included a flight and a four-night stay at a five-star resort with the senior executives of our company for the President's Club. Every year it was some brand new, beautiful, and exotic location. This year, it was Maui. For those who hadn't achieved their plan yet, this was the final push to make it past the goal line. It felt like the movie Glen Gary, Glen Ross. If you were at the top, there was nothing to worry about. But if you were at the bottom, the end of the year meant you had a lot of work ahead of you, which could also mean looking for a new job. I was safe. I was better than safe. My year was already made. Now I was making a play not only for another deal or two, but for whatever it took to become top rep of the year. As the final days of the year came to a close, I was still making deals and smashing the gong in the middle of the bullpen, announcing another contract had been signed. I was on top of the world. Beside me sat Keith. Keith struggled through every day. He fought tooth and nail to get every deal he could to date, and December weighed down on him heavier than anything else. Every day, Keith would come in, and you could see the desperation on his face. He did the work. He worked hard. Some would even argue he worked harder than anyone else in the bullpen. But Keith couldn't close a deal if his life depended on it. And in some ways, it did. Because as December came closer and closer to an end, It was his life at the company, which was now in jeopardy. My sales territory wasn't anything different than Keith's. We had the same number and mix of clients and prospects to go after. I wasn't a better salesperson than Keith. We went to Xerox sales school at the same time. At that time, he had two years of previous sales experience, whereas I'd start right out of university as my first job. So all being equal, why was I sitting as number two in the entire country 
and Keith was struggling to make ends meet. It was attitude. I continued to close more deals in December than any other month that year. In fact, I did almost three months worth of sales in that single month. I booked meetings with clients to get to know them and their goals. I showed genuine interest in their business and showed them how I could help them save money or many times how I could help them make more money by showing them how to sell a new product or service to their clients. I was confident because I truly loved helping others. And when I left a meeting knowing, sale aside, I was helping another business and individual, my confidence grew. Yes, I truly wanted more deals, but if I didn't get it in the month of December, I was also okay. My boss often told me, Kim, we're still open in January. People will decide when the timing is right for them. I wanted more deals and I was working hard for every single one, calling on former clients and prospective new ones, stopping in at locations with boxes of chocolates to introduce myself. I considered myself hungry while Keith was desperate. I was willing to work hard for a deal and be okay if the client said yes or no. Keith, on the other hand, needed any sale and tried to push for the yes as quickly as possible. He would also put so much pressure on himself that he needed the yes, that if the client said no, it would crush him. The same way dogs can smell fear, clients can smell desperation, and no one wants to say yes to a desperate salesperson. Keith offered his prospects the deal of a lifetime. He would suggest there would never be another deal as good again. And if the client said no, he'd ask, well, why not? And how come? He could argue his questions were focused on the client, but the truth was his mind was really focused on him. He worried about how he was going to pay his bills and what he would do if he lost his job. He would put all his energy into every single client with whom he met, and despite giving it everything he had, they continually said no. Deflated, he'd go back to his car and try all over again until he was too exhausted to keep going. Day by day, each time feeling more defeated and exhausted. I think most of us have been there, or at least have known a Keith. Someone who tries with everything they've got, and yet it's somehow not enough to get the sale. They walk around exhausted. They need every dollar that comes in and they will do anything for it. What's really happened is they forgot the reasons they are there to sell in the first place. It's to help someone else achieve their dreams, not them. Zig Ziglar has a wonderful quote. You can have everything you want in life when you help enough other people get what they want. Keith's dreams may have been fulfilled, but only after he connects deeply and helps others get what they want. Keith's attitude needs to change, and then the sales will follow, not the other way around. So how did I know it was attitude and not some external factor? Maybe Keith wasn't cut out for sales, which many people will say about themselves. Maybe despite what I said before, Keith's territory wasn't that great. Maybe it was completely tapped out of all potential sales, which is also something many people will say about their own client base, territories, or service offerings. None of that was true. There's an old sales joke about two shoe salespeople who were sent to a remote island. Within a day of arriving, they sent a message back to the head office. Salesperson number one, no opportunities here. No one wears shoes. Salesperson number two, this island is a gold mine. No one wears shoes. Feeling he had to find a change, Keith left the company in the new year. Within a couple of weeks, a new salesperson had taken over Keith's old territory. Shauna was brand new to sales and was one of the most positive people I'd ever met. She wasn't even finished her third month and she was trending to become one of the top salespeople in the company. Shauna wasn't more skilled. The client base hadn't changed. Shauna was just genuinely keen. She was excited to help her clients. She came in every day despite how bad it was the day before, ready to tackle the world and provide amazing value to everyone she interacted with. More than anything, sales is an attitude. It's an attitude of giving, an attitude of being of service to others, and always staying positive in the face of adversity. Not every sale will go your way. Not every person will understand the benefits of what your service will bring to them. That's okay. Keep being positive. Keep believing in yourself. Keep sharing your gift with the world. There is an art to sales. 
but sales is first and foremost a numbers game. No matter how good you are, no matter how good your product or service is, you will never be able to find 100% of the people with whom you speak ready and able to buy in that moment. Many conversations will take days, weeks, months, and sometimes years before the prospect is fully ready. Keep being a better person every day. Don't take rejection personally. One day that prospect will say yes. And when they do, they'll follow up by saying, I wish we would have used you sooner. The one thing which remains constant is making sales, building a business, creating your empire, whatever your dream holds, takes time and a lot of patience. If you tell yourself it's hard, everyone else can do it or you're not good enough, this game will take its toll on you. If you want to be more successful in your business, value yours and others' time for what it is, the most valuable resource. Maximize it. Don't waste a single second of any day worrying about how you will pay your bills, where the next sale will come from, or what could have been or said done differently in that last call, sales meeting, or proposal. It's not worth it. Change it if you can and move on if you can't. Being negative, anxious, or worried doesn't solve anything. It doesn't serve anyone. Instead, ask yourself, what could you be thinking about and doing instead to focus on creating abundance? We all have the same limited time in a day. For every second you are focused on something outside of your control, you rob yourself of time you could be focusing the same energy on creating something amazing. Hours and days will pass you by. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. You can either choose to be obsessed with what you can't control or with what you can. Chapter 3. Hand Select Your Clients Premium service providers set up their business differently than businesses that are selling transactional type products or services. Premium service providers believe they don't need to sell to everyone. They just need to sell a few services. This is more of the Jerry Maguire way of thinking. And if you haven't watched this movie, sorry, major spo spoiler alerts, but really, you had more than 20 years. See, Jerry was busy working as a sports agent. The company he worked for had hundreds of employees and likely tens of thousands of clients. Then one day, after aggressively competing for hot rookie between him and someone he thought was his friend, he snapped. He came to the conclusion that it wasn't about going after more clients, but caring only about who was the top and forgetting about all the rest. It was about taking really good care of all the clients he had as an agent, even if that meant taking on fewer clients generating less money in the short term and giving each client more personal attention. In the end, because it's Hollywood, Jerry was someone able to make an amazing life only by having his single client bring him a wonderful lifestyle. Now, being okay with a single client is far too risky for anyone and I would never recommend that. With a single client, you are really set up, even if you're a contractor, as an employee. Your entire income is reliant on that one person. However, when building the business of which you dream, you do need to be focused. We want to live off the Jerry Maguire motto. Fewer clients, more personal attention. When we provide our clients an exceptional level of service, they will succeed and so will we. We just need to pay for that higher level of service. One of the first things I do with my students at KO Sales U is encourage them to get really clear on what they need to create a list of 100 they will ultimately pursue. Now you may be thinking, wow, 100 is a lot. I can't handle that many clients. The good news is you won't. This is just a list of prospects. Not everyone on your prospect list will say yes when you call them and yes, actually calling them, but it does help to keep the conversation focused and repeatable. Reading that I'm only recommending a list of 100 prospects, you may have thought the opposite direction. Wow, 100 is too little. There's no way I can create my business on so few prospects. In which case, I challenge you. If selling 10 of your premium services to this list doesn't bring you to 100% or relatively close to your full year revenue goal, you are selling your services too low. You are not strongly positioning yourself as the premium service provider. Now, I wish it only took 10 deals to make an entire year. 
Unfortunately for many businesses, that's not the reality. But the idea is to shoot for the stars and land on the moon. Go for the big ones. Step into rejection. Settle for smaller deals when you have to. It will work out. First and foremost, focus that energy. Be where your clients are. Reach out when you can't be in the same room. Go fishing in the stocked ponds. Fish where there are fish. I spend a lot of my time speaking at free events hosted by banks such as ATB when I'm in Alberta and other entrepreneurial organizations. Yes, this is a very shameless plug for ATB. Most of my business wouldn't be where it is today without this relationship. Oftentimes, my ideal clients are brand new to entrepreneurship and don't know where to turn to resources. The free talks I give provide many new business owners with the first concrete advice they need to create a sales process and why having a process is so important. I love sharing my knowledge, hence one of the reasons I decided to write this book. I love helping more people, which is why I typically host free sales strategy sessions after my events. I would also love to help you too. Please reach out to me as you're going through this book, even if it's just to tell me that you're going through this book. If you are ready to take serious action on creating a sales strategy for yourself and your team, I would also be happy to navigate this information and we can turn that education into application. You can feel free to email me about anything, anytime at Kim at KOAdvantage.com. I may speak at plenty of free events, but rarely do I attend free events to network. I find many people attending free networking events are there to search for like-minded individuals and sometimes these events can turn into a pitch fest where everyone starts walking around and plugging their products and service without taking a moment to get to know the person to whom they are speaking. I'm not saying all events are like that, but a vast majority of them are. I do attend paid networking events. Even the events we host will be anywhere from a $5 donation to charity to a $30 lunch and learn with lunch included. Setting a price creates a slight barrier to entry for those who are serious about being in a quality room and those who want to just push business cards like they're handing out entertainment cards on the Vegas Strip. And like the difference in a room from a no line free cover to a hefty entrance fee, the overall quality in the room increases as well. By knowing you have to pay even just a little allows you and others to associate a certain amount of value to the event everyone is far more likely to commit to showing up. On the events you decide to either host or attend, first get clear on who you want as an ideal client. What questions do you have? About what are they concerned with besides your product or service? Where are they going to source that information? Tailoring your message and reading the message of others, you will be able to go where your ideal clients are. There's a saying, fish where there are fish. You would never go to a sparse pond hoping to catch a record-breaking fish, nor would you go to a freshwater lake and try to fish for a fish that lives in the ocean. Get clarity on who your ideal client is and make sure you are setting yourself up for success to meet them quickly. Take time to understand who your ideal client is. Ask yourself questions such as, where would we find this client? And what would they be doing? A dance school for nurses. I once had a woman connect with me and ask if I would be willing to share some of my sales knowledge with her for her online business community. I was honored and together we hosted an amazing sales conversation. When the session finished, one of the viewers reached out to me. She said the advice I'd given was great for a company that was looking for other business clients. But what about her? She owned a dance studio in South Carolina. Her biggest struggle was to get more people signed up for monthly memberships. I asked her, What clients do you ideally like to work with? She told me she had a wide variety of people, but the ones who typically stayed as lifetime members were the nurses. See, many of the nurses she encountered often dreamt as little girls about becoming professional dancers. They danced two or three days a week when they were in school, but as life took over, and as it does, it also took over the dream of becoming a professional dancer. And that's why they loved her school. They felt young again, It was great physical activity and the movement of dance melted the stress away. As a business owner, this woman could feel the energy of the camaraderie built on the dance floor with these women who wore their superhero nurse scrubs by day and moved freely at night. That's it, I explained to this woman. Don't try to overcomplicate the solution to your problem. If you want more nurses, 
go get them. This confused the woman a bit. But how? She questioned back. Print off some flyers and stop into every hospital, doctor's office, dentist's office, and clinic in a six-mile range. Tell the receptionist what you just told me. You have a dance school and many of your members are nurses who as children dreamt of becoming professional dancers. Now, as adults, it's a great way to connect to that love while at the same time melting away the stress of the day. I told her if she stopped at three clinics every day for a month, her membership would be completely full by the end of the month. Sure enough, it only took three weeks and every one of her classes were booked that semester. Understand your value before you communicate it to others. When we're in a sales cycle, sometimes we forget we should be in the power position. Starting from the days of the saying, the customer is always right, we began to put the client in the power position. And that is true for some things. Our clients are special and they deserve to be treated as such. But somewhere along the line, we forgot that we're also special. We forgot that our products and services shouldn't be offered to everyone. As premium service providers, we deal only with those individuals who appreciate and graciously welcome our presence. Do you think high-end car dealerships try to push every person they meet into being interested in their product? Of course not. If they did, they would find themselves far too busy with the individuals who will never buy nor truly appreciate their product. And in turn, those who were their ideal clients would find themselves turned off by the lack of personal attention and the opportunity to feel exclusive. Hosting a party for your clients. Imagine you are hosting a high-end dinner party. You have limited resources for your party, only a select number of seats at the table, funds to spend on the event and the time to dedicate on the guests who are in attendance. If you decide to invite everyone you've ever met, you may throw out a Facebook invite blast and end up with one of two different outcomes. Either far too many people would show up and there wouldn't be enough chairs for everyone to feel comfortable. The quality of the food offered would be lower as you opted for frozen appetizers over a plated dinner. Each person would only receive a small amount of your time, sometimes nothing more than a brief greeting. Guests, if you call them that, would feel like they weren't fully connecting with you personally. And yes, they might have a good time, but that was a good time created by your personal involvement with them or the general environment you created. In the second scenario, you may only have a few people attend. The individuals who are craving your personal attention would likely not come because they didn't want to feel lost in a crowd of people. You bought far too much food for the number of attendees, and although each person might receive their fill in the lower-valued offering, you'd still diluted the entire experience. You gave people their fill of low-priced beer instead of high-priced champagne. I had a friend who would do this for every invite she extended. She'd call and ask me and my husband to join her and her husband for dinner. But when we arrived, there was always more than 20 other people there. I loved spending time with her and looked forward to going over to her house for what I thought would be quality time as two couples. But when I arrived, I never had the opportunity to really get into a deep conversation. She was so busy entertaining everyone else in the room that I began to feel left out. Eventually, I learned her invites were never exclusive. And if I wanted to spend time with her, it would have to be on my terms, not by her invitation. Now, as a party host, imagine instead you decide to invite those who love and appreciate what you have to offer. You've extended your invitation to those you know will attend and appreciate the company you provide them. Perhaps this is only one other person, or maybe it's a handful of people. Regardless, each person at the table feels special. You've provided well thought out extra details such as place settings with their names, a personal greeting when they arrive, and extra time to have an engaging conversation with each person. The meal you provide is high quality spread with each dish selected specifically to accompany the subsequent courses. Your beverage choice is a high end wine made to complement the flavors of each dish. At the end of the night, you thank each person personally as they walk out the door for gracing you with their presence and conversation. With which of those parties would you rather attend? Which one would you rather throw? There's nothing wrong if you said you want to host the first party. I've attended my fair share throughout my lifetime. I know what to expect. And if that's the experience I'm looking for, I'm happy to put myself in that position. However, I also know when I attend a massive shaker, I'm fully aware I will need to take care of myself because the hostess has a lot of other people to greet and connect with while I'm there. 
If you chose the higher end dinner party as the one you'd rather host, then ask yourself, are you creating this high end experience when your prospects engage with your product or service? No matter what, you can't have both. You can't try to create plated dinners with table settings and then invite 100 people. The first few people to arrive will love it, but as more and more people show up, it ruins the entire experience for everyone. The value triangle. The value triangle is a simple economics model for determining where your product, service, and quality fit in. In the value triangle, you can have the best price, the best service, or the best quality of product. You can choose any two, but you can't have all three. If you try for all three, something will give and it will be the market that decides. Usually the market chooses the best price, which either means your quality or your service must suffer. An example from retailer Michael Kors. Throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, many premium and luxury retailers began to open specialty and boutique le locations for their products. By 2017, as online shopping reached its peak, consumer spending in retail locations started to decrease and the competitive environment online became more heated. Plenty of retailers filed for bankruptcy protection. Luxury brands such as Michael Kors typically serve their clients with boutique stores. They create an experience for their product. Limited selection. Plenty of happy staff to walk with you throughout the store and chat with you about each product you looked on, held, or tried on. But as Michael Kors' name became more recognized, they decided to serve a larger selection of clients. They allowed discount retailers to sell their products at more locations across the country. They offered their high-end brand name at a reduced price. Suddenly, individuals who'd been interested in the premium product at the premium price were frustrated. Why would they spend two or three times the amount for the same product as everyone else? Yes, it may not have been the exact same quality item, but the challenge no longer became about the specific product. It was about the overall offering. Consumers visited boutique locations less often. The Michael Kors name became diluted. It was no longer the high-end dinner party people wanted to attend. It was turning into the low-end shaker. And if an individual wanted to own a Michael Kors purse, did it matter if it came from a discount retailer or a boutique location? For most people, it didn't. Michael Kors tried to be a bit of everything to everyone. They had to make a decision. They were offering a better priced product at more locations, serving more people, while subsequently offering higher service for their products for their premium price. Michael Kors tried to play in two different fields at the same time. And since they couldn't make a decision, consumers made the decision for them. They chose to purchase their products at the better price, whether that meant at the discount retailers or only if the products were reduced in price at the boutique locations. Over time, Michael Kors had to make the difficult decision of closing several boutique locations. No one wanted the premium service at the premium price. They were okay having the premium quality at a mid-level price. Where do you fit in the value triangle? Where do you see your product or service fitting into the value triangle? You can choose between the best price, best service, or best quality. You can choose any two, but you can't choose all three. Which two do you choose? And on which then will you not compromise? For example, if you want the best service and the best quality, you will not negotiate on price. But remember, if you decide you wanna have the best price product, know your limitations. After all, when the creator of 7 Minute Abs came out, he thought no one would beat him until someone released 6 Minute Abs. The last place you want to position yourself is in a race for the bottom.